What those texts make clear is that the early Semitic religion worshipped a pantheon structured as a divine family, with a father god, El, and his consort, this very same Asherah. Those two are the head of a heavenly council, and you'll see Peterson synopsizes the relevant information. The council is known by various names in the Uritic material, the Assembly of the Gods, the Assembly of the Sons of El. According to Canaanite belief, El was the creator god. Evidence strongly suggests that he was the original gods of the Semites generally. As creator, however, he also stood at the head of the pantheon as the father of the gods, or the father of the sons of God, and was called the ancient one, the patriarch, and the eternal one. Consequently, the gods as his sons were collectively, uh, were designated collectively as the sons of El. Yahweh was the preeminent among the sons of El in the Israelite conception. The gods of this heavenly council were assigned to the gods of various nations, Deuteronomy 32 and 8. And Yahweh was the god of Israel. As Israelite thought developed, El as the father receded into the background, and Yahweh continued to gain in prominence. This process of the elevation of Yahweh was in full force by the 8th century BC, when Asherah appears as Yahweh's consort, not El's. Mark S. Smith suggests, Asherah, having been the consort of El, would have become Yahweh's consort only if those two gods were identified by this time. Indeed, it is evident from texts such as Isaiah's vision of Yahweh surrounded by the seraphim, Isaiah 6, and especially the prophetic vision of divine counsel seen in 1 Kings 22.19, that Yahweh assumed the position of presider by that time. This gives us both a, an evolutionary trajectory, different kind of evolution, an evolutionary trajectory and a time frame. The heavenly council with El as the father and Yahweh as the preeminent son plausibly dates to the same time frame in the, as the Ugaritic, Ugaritic text, that is 1350 to 1150 BC. After that time, there is a developing theology in Israel that increases the importance of Yahweh and elevates him to a position where he begins to take over the functions previously assigned to his celestial father, El. This process is nearing its completion by about 700 BC when we find that Yahweh has not only taken over his, pa his father El's place in the council, he's taken El's consort as his own. In spite of the elevation to prominence and proto-monotheism, Yahweh's relationship to the council and to his father was not entirely severed by this process. Parallel strands, perhaps reinforced by other Semitic religions, maintain the stories of El and the divine or heavenly council. Dr. Peterson continues. The Canaanite terminology, the assembly of the gods and the assembly of the sons of El, finds its parallel in the Hebrew Bible in Psalm 21, 9-1, which has long been recognized by scholars as an Israelite adaptation of an older Canaanite hymn, members of the council are referred to as the Nehemim. The King James translation renders this phrase as the mighty. The same Hebrew phrase occurs in Psalm 89, 6, where the King James Version has the sons of the mighty. Neither rendition is, then, is adequate. In both passages, the New Jerusalem Bible, to choose one of the best of the modern translations, gets things precisely right by translating the name as sons of God. Equally as important to our understanding of Yahweh in the Council is the identification of Yahweh as the one who would atone as the Messiah. Margaret Barker's The Great Angel examines at length hundreds of passages and texts ranging from Jewish to Christian to Gnostic that, as she interprets them, identify Yahweh as the future Messiah and Jesus in his messianic role as equated with Yahweh. As she describes the heavenly council headed by the Father God, and now we're quoting Margaret Barker, Yahweh was one of the sons of El Elyon, and Jesus in the Gospel was described as a son of El Elyon, God Most High. In other words, he was described as a heavenly being. This, thus the Annunciation narrative has the term Son of the Most High, Luke 132, and the demoniac recognized his exorcist as Son of the Most High God, Mark 5 and 7. Jesus is not called the Son of Yahweh, nor the Son of the Lord, but he is called Lord. For example, the quotation from Deuteronomy 6, 5, which says, You shall love Yahweh your God, which is rendered in Luke 10, 27, You shall love the Lord, Kyrios, 
your God. This suggests that the Gospel writers, instead of using the term Lord and Son of the Most High, saw Jesus as an angel figure and gave him their version of the sacred name, Yahweh. Of course, this particular connection comes from the New Testament. Dr. Barker suggests that it was nevertheless a continuation of an old strand of thought that became obscured through the Deuteronomic reforms. Barker examines an interesting Old Testament passage about this messianic expectation that appears to have suffered some obfuscation. The clearest evidence for its survival, the anthropomorphism of God or Messiah, however, is in the widespread tradition of interpreting the words man as references to the Messiah, or of designating the Messiah simply as the man. This can best be seen by examining the various translations of the Balaam oracles, which were believed to predict the Messiah, Numbers 24 through 9, 15 to 24. Thus, in Numbers 24 and 7, where the Hebrew has the curious lines, water shall flow from his buckets, and he shall overflow, or he shall rule over many nations, became in the Septuagint, and there shall come a man out of his seed, and he shall rule over many nations. While both the fragment and pseudo Jonathan Targums have, their king shall arise from among them, and their savior shall be from out of them. Philo quotes the lines as messianic prophecy. There shall come forth from you one day a man, and he shall rule over many nations. The unanimity of both translation and targums suggests that the Hebrew may once have said something other than water shall flow from his buckets. Could an old strand of that they expected a Yahweh as Messiah have survived the Deuteronomic, Deuteronomic reforms to form the basis of a Christian understanding of Jesus as Messiah and Yahweh. This is at least suggested by an Aramaic text from Qumran K4, translated by Joseph Fitzmaier. Then shall arise a king, and he shall be great upon the earth. All people shall make peace with him. They shall all serve him, for he shall be called the Holy One of the great God, and by his name shall he be named. And he shall be hailed Son of God, and they shall call him Son of the Most High. This text is dated to 25 BC. At that time, it appears that there is arguably a continuation of the definition of the Messiah as the Son of God, particularly the Son of the Most High. When we reconstruct the religious climate at the time of Lehi, we find that there is no single unified theology. In fact, what we find is multiple strands of theological thought that are in conflict, with the Deuteronomic reform elevating a particular strand of thought in contradiction to what had been acceptable throughout much of Israel's history. The theology of the Book of Mormon suggests that Lehi is not only a product of that time period, but that his theology, and therefore Nephi's, is most likely an attempt to preserve some of the theology of God that was being denied in the Deuteronomic reforms. The following are elements of the pre-reform religion that we will see in the text of the Book of Mormon. A father God, El, who is called El Elyon, or Most High God. Yahweh as the Son of God, or El. Yahweh as the preeminent God of Israel, and Yahweh as Messiah. I suggest that the particular prominence of God as Messiah in the Book of Mormon is a reaction to the uh, reduction of that strand in the Israelite religion. What Nephi and Lehi believe to have been removed from the Deuteronomic reform receives compensatory emphasis in Nephi's foundational theology for his people and continues through to the end of the Book of Mormon. This is the reason the Book of Mormon is so consistently and adamantly a witness for the Messiah. We begin our examination of God in the Book of Mormon just a few verses before 1 Nephi 11 and 18, with which began the discussion. 1 Nephi 11 